My name is Kamran Bukhari. I'm the Senior Director for the Eurasian Security and Prosperity Portfolio at the New Lines Institute. Thank you all for coming. And today we will be discussing uh, India, its geoeconomic rise, its internal challenges, and the bilateral relationship with the United States. We're doing this at a very exciting time. Prime Minister Narendra Modi just visited uh, at, at, in the early part of the summer, Washington. It was a very successful trip. Uh, President Biden is, I believe, en route or on his way, will be on his way for the G20 summit that's taking place in a few days. Um, and, and India, you know, made history with the landing on the moon, specifically the South Pole, which no other nation has been able to achieve. So we're in a very, very uh, unique moment in history, uh, in the history of uh, U.S.-India relations, and I couldn't think of a better panel to have. Uh, to my right is Dr. Aparna Pandey. She is the director of the India Studies Center at the Hudson Institute. And we have Jeff Payne from the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. And he is a, uh, an expert on Indo-Pacific affairs. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's get started. And I'll start with uh, Aparna. Uh, and I want to ask, you know, let's start from the top. Uh, how would you characterize, if one were to sort of critically take a view of this uh, and, you know, putting the headlines aside and putting all the, the um, if you will, the hype, uh, both in New Delhi and in Washington, how would you explain where India is and this relationship with the United States? In many ways, it's new. In many ways, it's been a buildup. Uh, since the days of, uh, I would say, at least the Bush administration, uh, if not longer. But let's, let's take it from there. Um, thanks, Kamran. A pleasure to be here with you and Jeff. Um, I'd say let's go back uh, one presidential administration further, President Clinton. Um, every American president from President Clinton onwards um, has visited India during his tenure. Um, every Indian prime minister going back decades has visited the United States. So the symbolic level the relationship is strong. They don't call each other allies, but they are natural allies, not security allies, which India has an aversion to. Uh, but there are three pegs of the India-US partnership which have grown over the last few decades, from the 1990s. Um, there's the people-to-people, -people, uh, values-based relationship. We can discuss details uh, later in this panel, uh, but that, that relationship is based on sort of, you know, a mutual, sort of, you know, like for each country. If we look at polls in each country, India ranks very high in U.S. Uh, polling, and the United States ranks very high in India polls. The recent Pew poll showed that as well. At least 70% or 75% of, of the populace in each country likes the other country and believes it's a good partner and friend. There's a very large Indian-American diaspora in this country, plus the Indian students and tourists and others who come. Um, there's also the fact that this is the world's oldest democracy, that's the world's largest democracy. Um, and the two countries have built this values-based partnership. The second part is the economic dimension, which uh, in some ways I would say is, has yet to achieve its potential, um, though it has grown uh, considering the fact that India uh, was basically a semi-socialist economy until the 1990s. In the last three decades, India-US bilateral trade stands at around 180 billion, um, still has to achieve its 500 billion potential, uh, which was, I, I believe, the Obama administration had uh, hoped for that. But the partnership has grown um, in trade, in investment, in technology. Again, we can go into the details, the challenges that both countries face in this. And third is the strategic defense partnership. Um, Jeff knows a lot more about this and the details, but there was sort of, you know, India-US never had a defense relationship till, till mid-1990s. And the first time India purchased anything from the United States in the defense arena was 2008 onwards. So in 15 years, it's about $23 billion in defense trade, uh, some high-end equipment, some others from the MQ-9 Reaper drones to the, C, to the P-8Is to C-130s, uh, and this broader strategic partnership that both countries by and large see a similar 
I would say, Indo-Pacific strategic vision, free and open, India would say inclusive Indo-Pacific. Um, a similar aggression um, or challenges from China. Um, though there are, I would say, differences in how each side views its geographical concerns and threats. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. That was a great uh, intro into this conversation. Uh, so, Jeff, um, um, let's drop some altitude a little bit here. Uh, Aparna mentioned that, made a good point, that they are allies, we're allies with India, but natural allies, not security allies. Yet we see, uh, uh, you know, this growing strategic partnership. Uh, the United States renamed the Pacific Command to Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, there is a purchase of hardware that's, that's picking up. Uh, there is intelligence sharing that's, that's becoming very strategic, uh, and, and especially into the, the realm of you know, high tech as well, uh, in terms of defense, in terms of the defense sector. How would you characterize this relationship? Is this not a growing security relationship? Oh, it, it absolutely is a, a growing security relationship. Um, to add on to what has already been mentioned, um, beyond like the, the normal measurements of, you know, formal agreements, um, logistical supply chain uh, nods to each other, uh, high-level meetings and, and bilateral summits. There's a kind of general methodology that both countries see in an agreement, um, especially you see this in, in the air and the maritime domain um, in terms of transparency, all countries following the same rules and procedures, um, not a substantial redefinition of the rules unless all actors agree upon it. Um, and this vis-a-vis -vis often gets involved with how China is seen in terms of its rise throughout the Indo-Pacific. But also India is, is, is one of the first countries to kind of formulate an Indo-Pacific construct. Um, the United States was later to that game than India was. Um, in addition, that India has defined the Indian Ocean region, which is something the United States it, you know, needs India to, to work with them on because the U.S. obviously is more focused on the Pacific than the Indo part of the Indo-Pacific. Um, so there's a lot of, of information exchanges going on. And you get this at the senior level, but it's also now hitting the working level, which is where you see a lot of the kind of really substantive discussions are happening. So let me follow up on that. Um, and, and you mentioned that there's sort of this division of labor the U.S. focuses on the Western Pacific Basin and in India uh, on the Indo-Pacific, uh, on the Indian Ocean component of that uh, maritime space. Um, so, a explain why has there's there this gap? Because uh, as somebody who's not who doesn't study maritime space knows it from a much higher level, there is the Fifth Fleet in the in the Persian or the Arabian Gulf, and then you have the Seventh Fleet. And then there is the Indian Ocean that's sort of wide open. Uh, even before this partnership, this sure. sort of predates. Uh, you know, there was some talk during the tail end of the Trump administration to bring back the first fleet that would be somehow you know, headquartered somewhere in Singapore or northwestern Australia. But you know, that sort of came and went. Nothing, we didn't see anything happen from that. It was just talk at the time. Uh, how is India filling? this gap, or how do you see India filling this gap that's been there before this relationship? Well, Dr. Pandey, I know will have more to say on this than, than just me, but uh, in terms of India is obviously the largest maritime actor that is in the Indian Ocean. It, you can include France in that if you define France as an Indian Ocean region, uh, regional state, which um, because of its overseas territories it is. But India is the one that has the substantive like historical knowledge base of the Indian Ocean Rim. Uh, the United States has jumped in and out, but its geopolitical priorities have never emphasized the Indian Ocean besides certain times during like the Cold War. Um, but now the issue is it, it's less about where the strategic focal points are, and it's more about a kind of a new um, kind of transition towards information. Uh, maritime domain awareness, which is very much a niche conversation inside security operators, is becoming a much larger issue because technology is opening up all of these dimensions of information. Um, and India is a key anchor point on gaining not only this sort of technological information, but contextualizing it to regional you know, actors. This is also just not true of India. It could be true of Sri Lanka. It could be true of Oman. It can be true of Kenya and Tanzania. But India just has 
by far the most substantive maritime uh, industry as well as Navy and Coast Guard in the Indian Ocean Rim. I want to pose the same question with you to you, Paparna, uh, but with a small uh, shift in focus. So uh, tell us about sort of the experience of the Indian Navy with blue no water navigation and, and how it is attempting to project influence uh, in the Indian Ocean at a time when China has been working hard to build its presence in the basin. Uh, not successfully, we've seen the, 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 uh, the failures in Pakistan, the failures in Sri Lanka. I would also add the failures in Myanmar. Maldives. Maldives as well. So uh, please give us a sense of, you know, how is India reading what's happening to China and its project? And regardless of the Chinese project, what are India's long-term plans uh, in terms of blue water navigation? Um, so you know, I'll make three points. One is a broader strategic one. I mean, any Indian strategist, if you ask them what is India's neighborhood, they will say from the uh, Gulf of Aden to the Straits of Malacca, uh, which covers the entire Indian Ocean. But if you notice, it is the Indian side of the Indo-Pacific um, and what India often refers to as the Western and the Eastern Indian Ocean. Because from India's point of view, the one problem with the Indo-Pacific strategy is that it, it aligns with American military divisions of the world. So the, the Western Indian Ocean is technically under CENTCOM, Central Command, and not under Indo-Pacific Command. And so therefore, India sort of, you know, has always had a problem that, you know, India's India has a bigger concern with what's happening in the Western Indian Ocean because about 80% of India's trade comes via the Indian Ocean. Uh, Nine million Indians live in the Gulf and work in the Gulf, and they're Indian citizens who send about 50 to 60% of India's um, annual remittances. And most of India's oil and gas comes from the Gulf, and by default, the Western Indian Ocean. Um, sort of what has India done? India used to actually have um, India now, the Indian Navy works with the, with, the, with the maritime division of the Central Command. Um, I believe it was earlier this year or end of last year that an Indian liaison officer is supposed to be appointed to that um, based in Bahrain. Uh, Jeff may know better, but I believe sort of, you know, so um, India is going to be, so India, so the Indian Navy and the and Central Command will also work in a region which India, which is important to India. Second point, um, the Indian Ocean is an area where the Indian Navy has strengths. You know, you know your backyard. You know, sort of, you know, where other countries can come in. You know the choke points. You know where you should be deployed. So the Indian Navy is deployed in certain parts of the Indian Ocean where they can keep an eye and a watch on who is entering and who is leaving. India knows that if China comes from South China seaside, the Japanese Navy, the Australian Navy, the Southeast Asian navies, and the American navies are keeping a watch. Similarly, if anything comes from sort of you know from uh, from the other side, from the African side, the African command will keep an eye. But India has enough resources and deployments to keep an eye on what's happening in the Indian Ocean region. Third point: India is still. Built, I mean, the Indian Navy was, I would say, of the three services the most outward looking. Um, it issued a strategic paper and its vision in 2001, 2002, the first of the three services. Um, its relationships with foreign navies, including the American Navy, also was the first of the three services. Um, and so the relationships, the coordination are almost two decades old today. And there's a more open um, sort of, you know, um, there's more openness. For example, I think at the June um, summit, uh, the two countries announced that now there will be three Indian shipyards where American ships will be repaired. Um, I believe the first, this started last year, and now there'll be three Indian shipyards. Um, that's, the, that's not something many people know about. It's not really been broadcast, but it's a big thing for an Indian shipyard to repair American ships, not refuel, but repair them, not just for cost reasons, but because of location. Um, so in the hypothetical situation of something happening in South China Sea or further on, American ship, ships can come to an Indian shipyard for repair. Um, Jeff mentioned maritime domain awareness. Uh, the, the, 
the May June uh, sort of the May Quad dialogue talked about um, sort of the Quad maritime domain awareness, which now includes, I believe, three centers. One which is in uh, which is which is Sri Lanka or India. The second is Singapore, and one is going to be somewhere in the Pacific Islands. And these centers are going to use commercial shipping data to keep an eye on which ships, including sort of you know, um, are trans are passing the region and shared with every country which is interested. Um, and so while India may not actually participate in um, sort of, uh, let me rephrase, while India may not want Quad to include Malabar exercises and therefore become, therefore be seen as a nation NATO, India is doing everything else a sort of, you know, short of declaring it to be a security partnership. Uh, all the foundational agreements have been signed, uh, ships are being repaired, um, you know, you are sharing data in the sea and on the land on the India-China border. Um, India is helping from sort of, you know, not just uh, HADR, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, but piracy, um, you know, freedom of navigation exercises, port calls and visits, training. Um, India gifted a, a frigate to, um, uh, to Vietnam. Um, India is selling uh, missiles to Philippines, Vietnam, and maybe even in Indonesia. Um, so I think there's a lot happening. It's just not what India would call an alliance. <laughs> you mentioned that a lot of it doesn't get out and not discussed and is not well known. One of the things that I noticed recently was the, the, the plan, and I, I don't even think the Indian press did justice with it, to reorganize at a very strategic level the entire Indian military establishment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you uh, unpack that for our uh, viewers uh, and, and, and the audience uh, in terms of how that helps India prepare for this brave new world that it's entering? So, um, I mean, India is one of those countries which, which has always viewed itself, as both of you know, as a global power, not just a regional power. But unlike many other countries, India has is rarely focused on the defense part of it or the military. India is one of the, India has always believed it's, you know, it's economic, soft power and democracy and location are sufficient. Um, and so it's never invested in the military, sort of military strategy or military reorganization. Um, and so a lot of the Indian military today is the legacy of what the British military used to be. Um, the aim over the last few years and especially recently has been to, uh, to to ensure that um, India is able to deal with both its, what it calls its two front threats, the China, from China and Pakistan on the border, um, the air threat over, uh, over, the, over the country, and the maritime one. Um, and so there's a sort of, they are, India is re sort of, you know, um, sort of not necessarily breaking up, but reconfiguring all of its commands under, um, there, there will be an air command, there will be a northern command, there will be a western command, and there will be a maritime command. Um, it's still some way to go, but sort of, you know, if they combine that with, um, I believe there was a discussion of they're going to re, um, sort of reconfigure and reorient India's defense research and development organization, DRDO. Um, so if they combine that with that, then it will be easier for India to, uh, for, for India to integrate strategy with, with military. Historically, India's defense strategy has come from its diplomats, not from its service officials. And I'm sure Jeff knows this very well. The services have never been part of strategy, but you need to include your services, uniformed services, in strategy. And I believe this is an attempt to do so. Um, I will be skeptical and say I want to see the result before I actually see this as something uh, drastic because, you know, um, India very often starts things, but it takes either a decade or two um, or, you know, something else happens and India gets, India's attention gets diverted. So I would wait to see the result in the next decade, uh, whether or not this happens, but it's a good start from India is what I would say. Thank you. Um, I'll come back to you more on the internal dynamics and what's sort of holding India back, but I want to uh, pivot to China. Uh, and I want to, so Jeff, obviously China is watching all of this. They, sure. they, they see the, you know, the, the growth of India the, in all these various 
uh, sectors that we've touched upon. What is the Indian, so, well, sorry, what is the Chinese strategy to deal with this? Uh, the only thing that someone like myself sees is them strategically poking India on the Himalayas. They don't seem to have a strategy. Is it because their, you know, their economic situation is, is taken a turn for the worse uh, in, in recent months? Um, and I mean, even before we we didn't see an overt uh, evidence of any Chinese counter strategy. Yeah, it's 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 a good question, and, and certainly something that a lot of people in Delhi and in South Asia, Southeast Asia, talk about, like the India-China relationship. Um, most people, if they follow it, they see it through the prism of the of the line of actual control and the tensions over the border. Um, but comprehensively, uh, to put it bluntly, given China's opaque nature, um, it's it's hard to navigate essentially how China really perceives things other than its relationships, say, with the European Union or with the United States. Um, it does not frame India as a peer. It does not frame it as a real threat. It's a regional state that is an annoyance at times, a potential collaborator to others, um, perhaps a spoiler on specific things. But this is changing as well because, again, we're in a dynamic where China's activities, its, it's aggression, especially in the maritime domain, um, have become more problematic for them because the new methodology is put it out in the world. Like China says they're not doing what they're doing. Okay, we're going to film it, and we're going to film it from multiple shifts, from multiple angles from that, that are hailed from different countries and say, okay, you're telling us that we're supposed to believe your statement versus what we're actually recording. And India's done this very, very effectively in the Bay of Bengal with, with China's scientific missions, uh, its overseas fishing fleet, um, that test everything from exclusive economic zones to understandings in the scientific community about biodiversity um, to essentially the normal parameters of ships operating at sea. Um, and India chronicles these. And they're not the only one, but India has a far greater capacity than a lot of regional states. For the United States... Um, this is, 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 doesn't, should not necessarily be framed from the U.S.-China um, relationship. Uh, the dynamics between Delhi and Beijing are very, very complicated in their own right, can drive you mad in their own right, um, but it just shows the comprehensive kind of reorganization of the Indo-Pacific and how it is or something that's real because the Indo-Pacific has become a, a kind of framework for a shared set of rules and norms. The free and open Indo-Pacific is not just a talking point. Countries are buying into it. Um, and India represents another potential leader for that construct. It doesn't have to be a U.S.-defined system. Um, it can be a collaborative system or even a system based upon India, which is a member of BRICS, which has relationships in the Indian Ocean Rim and Southeast Asia in a way the U.S. does not or the European Union does not or the traditional West does not. Um, but the fact that Delhi and the United States see the same kind of problems coming out of Beijing and their activities just highlights that this is not an aberration that can be defined from how Washington or how Beijing define one another. Aparna, you mentioned earlier that um, the Southeast Asian navies, as well as the, the American Navy and the Japanese and the Australians, uh, they're all sort of keeping uh, a very laser focus on what China is doing in the maritime space. So I get that that sort of relieves some of the responsibility and the pressure on India. But I want you to sort of talk about uh, what's happening in, in countries that are more closer, the Southeast Asian countries that are more closer to India, say Myanmar, say Thailand. I, I know we were talking uh, earlier before um, our event began that and you were mentioning something about that, and I, I recently uh, read somewhere that there is some concern about the Andaman and Nicobar Islands as well. Uh, and so what, what is the threat perception from India in that space? Because we always hear about the Himalayas. We don't get to hear about how India is sort of looking at this Chinese threat. Uh, if we do, it's in Gwadar, and, and Gwadar is neither here nor there. Everybody knows that. So please... Sure. Um, so I'd say um, from the, I mean, India's traditional perception of the Indian Ocean and broader Indian Ocean region has been that India is a resident power and most countries have no option but to look at India. 
that changed and it took a long time for India to realize that by the 1990s and India's view of China's strategy has always been calling it a string of pearls strategy, right? A number of bases and locations where China is um, and sort of, you know, strategically encircle India. India sees that in South Asia. Um, every neighbor of India, not just Pakistan, um, has sort of received a lot of economic investment uh, plus Chinese attempts at elite capture, whether it's Sri Lanka, it's Maldives, Pakistan to some extent, Nepal, uh, hasn't happened in Bangladesh or Bhutan, but not for lack of trying by China. And Bangladesh does receive a lot of uh, economic assistance. Um, and so what India's strat counter strategy has been a little late, started almost a decade after China, is to offer these countries you know, developmental assistance, lines of credit, offer to build their ports and infrastructure such that it's, it's through grants or very low interest loans or assistance from World Bank, ADB, Japan, United States, but not China. And they've been partly successful, I would say, in some of the neighbors, and I will leave Pakistan out of this, uh, the other neighbors, um, much better with Bangladesh and Maldives and Sri Lanka, um, despite Hamban Tota, um, sort of not as sort of, you know, as sort of, you know, uh, it's a little bit of a balancing game with Nepal. But if we go further out, um, India sort of, you know, for India, Southeast Asia is important, not just for economic reasons, uh, but because of India's own internal security. India's Northeastern states border continental Southeast Asia. Um, and India has faced insurgencies for a long period of time, from 1950s, some of them homegrown, but some of them also supported uh, in earlier decades by, by Pakistan and in later decades all, all throughout by China. And so India has sought better relations with Myanmar or Thailand and then further on Malaysia um, and all of the sort of continental Asia, Southeast Asia to ensure that it can, that those countries keep India's interests in mind. For example, India and Myanmar the name, the armies have often, you know, acted against those insurgent groups together. Um, India is also building the India, Myanmar, Thailand uh, trilateral highway, which is supposed to go all the way, you know, further beyond Thailand um, uh, to, the, uh, to the South China Sea uh, by land. Um, India is building regional electricity grids with Myanmar. Um, similarly, if we go out into the, the maritime domain, India has built relations, defense relations with Philippines. India has old standing defense relationships with Singapore. It's the only country which uses India's air bases for the training of its air force. Um, Andaman, Nicobar, and if we go into the sort of, you know, the, the islands in the region, um, India has helped, India is working with France, if I am not mistaken, uh, to build uh, the capacity for Réunion and the French um, sort of, you know, um, uh, regions or sort of, you know, affiliations um, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, India and Indo Indonesia helping build, um, sort of reconstruct and rebuild Sabang Airport, um, which juts out into the Straits of Malacca and is just, and is close to where Andaman Nicobar is, just off the Malacca Straits. Will the two countries actually Sort of, you know, will India sort of, you know, seek to, to stop China's entry into Malacca Straits? No. But it's, it's a deterrence. It's a deterrence to know that India is helping build Sabang port. India will allow or India has a tri-service command in Andaman Nicobar and is building up that island um, into a command. Um, that India can watch the Chinese Navy and Chinese submarines as they come and go or ocean research vessels which are very often uh, their defense, maybe. And if you go to the other side of the Indian Ocean, India is helping Oman build the port of Dukum. Um, and India is sort of, you know, helping a number of countries across East and Southern Africa with whom it has old historical diaspora um, and developmental ties. And then if you go into the Gulf area, India has very close strategic partnership with UAE, uh, building one with Saudi Arabia, with Egypt, and so it's sort of, you know, India has been slightly late in the game, but it's building the, not just, it's using the, the historical and economic partnership to build on the, the more strategic defense uh, element. 
We will come back to, to the maritime space in, in Q&A, and, and I want to be mindful of time here. But I, before we, so we have like 10, 12 minutes left in, in, our, in our session before we open the floor up for questions and answers, I do want to get to the domestic situation in India uh, because it's, it, it's becoming increasingly uh, concerning here in Washington that while uh, India is this geoeconomic rising power, uh, not a formal security ally, but an informal de facto security partner, um, and, and that relationship is growing. So this creates sort of you know expectations, dependency uh, uh, on the part of the United States as it deals with the Chinese challenge. Uh, but then the question is, to what extent uh, you know is India going to uh, remain stable internally, given the change in the political culture? in the political climate with the rise of uh, right-wing uh, religious nationalism, uh, and, and it's uh, in such a powerful way. I mean, the, this isn't sort of like a uh, one of many movements. This is the movement, given the parliamentary majority, enjoyed by the, the ruling BJP of Prime Minister Modi. So where do you see, uh, you know, what is your outlook, say, you know, in the next three to four years on how this will pan out? Because Clearly, Prime Minister Modi and the BJP have this imperative to take India to the next level, economically on the global stage. But can their domestic political uh, compulsions hold them back? Um, I mean, I can give a short answer and ask everybody who's watching to read my book, which came out three years ago, which, which argues why India is not going to be a global power for some decades to come. But I'll give the longer answer, which is that you know, sort of domestic politics will always influence foreign policy. Um, India's potential has always been that it is the counter to China or any autocratic uh, country. It's the country which remained, which was post-colonial country, which remained a democracy, avoided a military coup, did not send its military out to other countries, built its economy despite being a democracy and educated its people, and has given assistance and aid and stayed out of any bloc during the Cold War. Um, that is the reason why countries around the world want India's rise and have been booing India for the last few years and continue to do so. Um, I do believe that, you know, sort of the rise of um, of populist, uh, religious, or ethnic nationalism is going to hurt India um, and India's uh, foreign policy, but also its rise. You cannot have, I mean, yes, I know people will give the counter of China and say you can have economic rise during autocratic rule, but China is different. It's by and large a homogenous country, India is not. India is a heterogeneous country. India has ethno, linguistic, religious diversity. A country like that can rise economically and militarily and play a role only if it is cohesive politically and socially. Um, and so sort of the, the more that, you know, that nationalism is allowed to rise and grow and allowed to impact India's economic potential, um, its entrepreneurial potential, its relations with its neighbors and beyond, it will prove a hindrance. Sort of, you know, as an Indian, I actually believe, or may, maybe part of it is hope, even though hope's not a strategy or a policy, it's a hope is that India's diversity is its strength at some level. Um, you know, sort of, it, sort of, the pushback against religious nationalism is coming from old secular Indian nationalism. Um, it's still there. And we must remember that India's, demo, sort of, India's electoral system is first past the post. So with 33% or 30% also you can win elections and win seats. Um, and to date, the ruling party has never won more than 34 or 35%. But since there are three parties on the opposite side, the ruling party has managed to get. Now, what will happen in next year's elections? I don't know. I don't like to predict more than three months before an election because you never know which way it's going to go. Um, and so we need to wait for next year. But I do believe that the pushback against the rise of religious nationalism will come from within India. It's not going to come from outside. And, it, and 
I, I do hope that the, the ruling party realizes that the way to achieve $500 billion in trade with the United States is going to be focusing on economics, um, not on, um, on social re-engineering or on rewriting history. Jeff, what, how are we watching this from, what's the view here in Washington in the circles that you move around? How are they, how are they taking this? Is this like seen as something really uh, you know, serious or more manageable? Um, I would say it's more manageable. Again, it depends on the context where you're, you're, you're framing it. But um, are there problems internally in India's polity? Absolutely. But there are, there are problems inside the United States polity as well. Um, democracies are incredibly messy, and India is, even among democracies, is incredibly messy. The fact they have elections is a Herculean task in and of itself. Um, but that being said, there, there's, there's, you know, for every factor you could bring up saying, oh, this is worrisome, there's another factor that, that comes out. The economic reforms that are coming about, there's more and more startups. There's a startup culture that's starting to be framed, especially in the technological sector in India. Um, this kind of legacy of socialism is, is a little bit falling away. Um, the, the regional dynamics, so you're getting regional economies that are starting to become more mature, and that, again, creates different forces. Um, but the main thing I would, I, I would argue from a U.S. point of view um, is say what you will about India, Delhi, the United States, Washington, um, what happens happens on television screens. It's chronicled in newspapers. It's, it, the press is still active. Uh, citizens are still recording. They're still debating. They're still arguing with one another in the streets. Um, compare that to the other side of the coin. Um, it's often framed, especially on the world stage, as a weakness. Um, but I think in the long term, I think it works if your, your, your time lapse is like a month. But if you're looking over years and even decades, this is where democracies thrive. Um, now, if democracy starts eroding in any context, that's problematic. But again, how do you define that erosion? But compared to, say, what China's like and the fact that everyone's now talking, uh, two months ago everyone's talking about how strong China's economy is. Now we're talking about, will China's economy collapse because they're having the biggest of all housing market collapses in, in human history. Um, we saw Russia and Putin's regime as a global military power, you know, a year and a half ago. Now, you know, are they even a regional power of any substantial regard beyond their nuclear arsenal? Again, having things in transparency, in sunlight, is the biggest kind of advantage that both India and the United States have. Well, thank you so much. I, we're, we're almost done here, and I, I want to give time for uh, the quest, question and answer session. So uh, I'll uh, take the privilege of being a moderator, ask the first question, and then we'll uh, pass it on to the floor. Um, both of you have laid out sort of this, um, you know, the, the gist of what, at least what I've understood from our conversation is that uh, yes, there's a lot of hard work that needs to be done. There are challenges. Uh, but this relationship uh, is headed in, in a very strong and, and robust direction. Um, some would argue, some would argue that uh, India is, is not sort of like, cannot be seen as uh, one of the sort of typical U.S. allies. Uh, it's not Japan. It is not Germany. It is not the UK, um, and we have our problems with France, and you know that's a, that's a separate story. But India is India. India has has a history that Aparna talked about of being non-aligned. Um, in this, uh, you know, in the in the coming years, wouldn't India assert itself uh, and want to be able to have best of both worlds, a strong relationship with the United States where it suits India, but at the same time maintaining. Uh, you know, it's freedom of operation. In other words, not tethering itself to sort of, you know, the, the broader U.S. alliance structure. So that's part one. Part two is that from, and which flows from part one, is that uh, the investments that back in the 80s and, and the 90s that we did in China uh, had a, an outcome, which is that it did not join the comedy of nations. It, it, you know, we thought that if... It, 
if communist China were to be integrated economically into the global system, that it would learn to play by the rules of, of the game or the international, respect the international rules-based order over time, of course. Uh, some are, would argue that, and I've heard this from many people, that perhaps we're doing the same thing with India now. In, in order to, we did that with China to counter the Soviet Union. Now we're uh, you know, having the same approach, similar approach with India to sort of meet the, you know, the challenge of China. And is this somehow going to backfire or at least we won't get what it is that we are uh, trying to achieve in this moment? Maybe our goalpost shifts in the future as, we, you know, as, as this relationship moves forward. But love to get both of your thoughts on that. So your two questions, the first one, I'd agree, yes, India was non-aligned, is strategically autonomous, and that is not going to change for the foreseeable future. Um, India prides itself on its independence of decision making. That dates back to the colonial legacy um, and India's notion that Indians weren't allowed to make decisions and therefore India will make a decision. India sort of, you know, you mentioned a number of American allies, and the one you said you have a prob the U.S. has a problem with, that's the country India, actually India's foreign policy may be most closely aligned with, temperamentally and actually, France. India is more like Gaullist France than it is like, like the special relationship with United States, U.K. or Canada or Germany. Every country's foreign policy is based on geography to some extent. The United States is lucky to have Canada to the north and Mexico to the south. Every country doesn't have the same geography, and so your geography dictates how you will go. And so India's geography dictates that India needs to balance its relationships between Russia and China, um, you know, the Gulf countries and Iran, Israel and Iran, and everybody else in between. So strategic autonomy and the global south or the former developing countries. The advantage today is that India is a bridge the global south because the global south and India share a number of things in common but India has good relations with the US and its al and its partners and allies and that I don't see changing irrespective of how close the two countries get. Second question actually I would say that in some ways the difference is this the US and other countries wanted to convert a revisionist power China into a status quo power which History and political science would have said it's impossible. Revisionist powers don't give up their claims. Russia hasn't, China hasn't. India is a status quo power, was when it came on the global stage, and despite the rise of nationalism, remains a status quo power. India does not crave territory. I mean, I will leave Kashmir aside. That is a different issue, and we, that will be a much longer conversation, yes, Kamran. So we will not go into Kashmir. <laughs> I've avoided that. Yes, <laughs> and, but India doesn't have territorial or ideological ambitions. It doesn't promote democracy. It doesn't, you know, sort of seek territory. And so it's a status quo power which abides by the rules of the games. It accepts its its borders. It accepts other countries' borders. And so, sort of, you know, it may not, it may not sort of join a block, but it is not going to become a revisionist power like China or like Russia a decade or two or more from now. Same question for you. Yeah, um, I would agree with the, the, the way <laughs> Dr. Bande uh, answered the first question. The second question, the, the data points that I would add is, um, and again, I have to do the caveat where I'm not speaking for anyone besides myself, et cetera, et cetera, because... The U.S. and India disagree substantially on their bio our respective bilateral relationships with their countries, uh, the, re the, the way the United States perceives Iran versus the way Delhi perceives it. Um, the, the divisions are, are seam issues, the way that we refer to it in the security community between the, the, the combatant command divisions. Um, I've always told our Indian friends that th this is actually an advantage because there's three different audiences you can actually make an argument to de depending on your interest, AFRICOM, CENTCOM, or Indo-PACOM. Um, but regardless of any of that, there, there's, there's bilateral disagreements. Um, the way that we pursue the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas, we interpret certain provisions of that. India does not like freedom of navigation operations that the United States undertakes. But you know what? The point is, we agree with the, the methodology that countries use to bring these things up and to disagree about them. Um, in the long run, I don't think it's about the U.S. defining what India is going to do. And I think that is a talking point 
that Washington has to get comfortable with, period, in the area that, the, the era that we're in. Um, the United States is the world's largest economy. It is the world's largest military power. It still is the world's largest diplomatic actor. But does not mean, nor should it mean, that we define the, the, the tune of music for the entire world. Um, and I think what the world needs to understand about Washington is that Washington is having the conversation that Riyadh is having, that Delhi is having, where you see everything through your own eyes. It's just that Washington eyes are presented around the world, um, where you don't necessarily see that out of Delhi yet. Um, you're starting to see it, which is what everyone's like, well, what does this mean for the long term? I think the long term is India is going to do what India does. And when it aligns, it's going to be positive. It's going to be a net win. When it doesn't align, there are mechanisms to figure it out. On that note, we will open the quest the floor. Sir. Um, the panel has talked about the importance of a rules-based... Sir. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, the panel has talked about the importance of a rules-based international order. Could you please introduce yourself? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Roger Cochetti, and I'm an editorial contributor to the Hill newspaper. Um, the panel has talked about the, the, the importance of a rules-based international order. And uh, I wanted to bring up a small issue that has enormous symbolism in which I would have assumed that India would have the decisive, in fact, the overwhelmingly decisive vote, but I can't figure out what the Indian policy on it is, and that is the Chakos Islands. Um, uh, for those who don't know, the Chacos Archipelago is in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It was part of a British colony. The British granted independence to Mauritius, but said we're keeping the Chacos Archipelago for ourselves, and then immediately granted a 99-year lease to the United States Navy for the naval base at Diego Garcia, probably the largest naval base in the Indian Ocean. The International Court of Justice ruled that the British occupation of uh, the, the Chacos Islands and the expulsion of the natives who lived there in order to make way for the base was un illegal under international law. The UN General Assembly has repeatedly voted that the, U the British occupation of uh, Chacos Islands was illegal and any agreements that the British colonial authorities entered into while it was illegally occupied have no legal bearing. So. The issue is rules, if the International Court of Justice says that British occupation of the Chacos Island is illegal, and consequently by implication, the military, the legality of the military base at Diego Garcia has no foundation, um, I would have assumed that the power that would have really the decisive vote on this is not Britain and not uh, the United States, but India. It should be India's decision on what happens to the future of the Chacos Islands. But as far as I can tell, I, I, India's position is, we're thinking about it. We don't know. You can make a case this way or that way. And uh, you know, I don't know where the rules-based international order fits into this in India's point of view, or where India's, this could be India's uh, Pearl Harbor, for all I know. This, this might be an Indian naval base. but. Anyway, so if anybody can shed some light on the Indian policy towards the Chacos Islands and Diego Garcia, that would be helpful. And then one other quick question. If India changed its name to Bagat, will it insist that the Indian Ocean be changed to the Bagat Ocean as well? Thanks. Uh, we should have done instead of in addition yeah, to Kashmir, okay. we should have also said Dichi. We're yeah. not going yeah. <laughs> to. <laughs> I mean, the answer to your second question, Bharati Ocean will be very difficult for India to do. So, I mean, my take on it is that the Indian Constitution says India, that is Bharat. Both words are in the Indian Constitution. Every Indian official sort of, you know, paper, the name of every Indian ministry is both in English and in Hindi. In Hindi, it says Bharat, in English, it says English. I know, sort of, you know, I see this more as the symbolism for an event. Um, this is the year of India. It has been nine months of India from the UN Security Council presidency to the G20 summit and everything else in between. So I see this more as symbolic to change 
to put bharat into every english word would mean reserve bank of bharat it would be bharatiya ocean it would be everything it would be bharatiya railways which will be problematic and so i don't see them doing that i'm not saying they may not try to do it but it will divert attention away from and resources but coming to your first question actually there's an answer to it and there's an answer which has been there it's like those who ask why did india not condemn russia in the ukraine war there was a reason for it india has never condemned sort of you know has avoided entrance into any conflict india never condemned soviet union go invading yugoslavia invading czechoslovakia afghanistan um india stayed out of the iraq uh, sort of you know kuwait war india indian foreign minister was actually photographed hugging saddam hussein mm -hmm. unfortunately uh, during that crisis um india's india's position on the chagos island is 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 a combination of two one india as a post colonial power and a country which was under british rule and you know had to take territories from france and portugal and actually send in the army to get to force portugal out of goa is has always supported the colonial power sort of uh, the the colony versus the colonial power so india cannot support british demands that the lease should be given to the united states on the other hand strategy demand that the the us presence in that region is preferable to chinese presence india will never have a base anywhere india doesn't believe in bases bases are colonial they are not india india doesn't send troops except under un peacekeeping mission um and so base would be but if us leaves china may come in so india doesn't want china to come in so india has a problem in you know if india says we want the us to stay mauritius gets upset and other uh, post colonial countries get upset if india says that mauritius has the right to push out united states then india's strategic concerns have a problem so india's policy in this is we are thinking we are going to let mauritius decide and hopefully convince mauritius that they should do something which is in regional and global interest and then when mauritius decides india can come in and say okay mauritius has officially leased it to united states and so we are on board with that so india has a has it it's a it's a concern it has there are no real really good answers for india in this publicly they'll only be privately the, the rules based international order play any role in that discussion yes but the rules based international order would mean that india needs to say that the united states get out of there because that's a, a you sort of you know so that would mean upholding it would would go against india's strategic concerns <laughs> others hello and thank you for an excellent discussion today my name is nick harris of the new lines institute So my question wants to focus on a topic that was mentioned briefly earlier in this discussion, which is the role of the growing Indian American community on India-U.S. relations. Uh, as you know, there are three candidates in the Republican side of the field for president who are Indian American. Um, there's a growing number of Indian American congressmen and women, and some of the challenges that have been highlighted in terms of the internal. Indian domestic political debate we are watching in real time play out uh amongst the Indian American community in the United States. So I'd like to ask just if you would forecast a little bit over the next 3 4 years or longer how will the sort of grow in power reach but also divisions within the Indian Indian American community affect the US Indian strategic relationship. Thank you. I presume I'm supposed. I I I am the person who this is talking. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'd say, you know, there's um, when you have a large diaspora, um, and the diaspora has citizenship in that country, um, and cannot have citizenship in India because India doesn't allow dual citizenship. Uh, that diaspora is very deeply integrated in that system. Um, and you know sort of there's there's a large indian diaspora in the gulf but they are not citizens they are indian diaspora they play a role in canada any country where they where they have citizenship indian american diaspora has been very involved politically um indian american diaspora is strong economically and you can see that in almost all the ceos um sort of you know there are indian americans in the as mayors in in you know in state assemblies 
um, also, you know, sort of running for elections for, for House and Senate and the Vice President. Um, see, the, the advantages India has is that the diaspora is by and large, I would say, uh, well off. It's called a model minority by many. Uh, it's a very small percentage of US population, but highly educated disproportionately to other diasporas and minorities, and very well integrated. So that's an advantage. And we can go back to, I'd give the example I'll give actually is, is the Kargil War. When the Kargil War took place, even before that, when the US imposed sanctions on India for its nuclear test, the Indian American diaspora came out to push back against those sanctions and came out asking, you know, President Clinton to support India in the Kargil War. It was big. And that's sort of, you know, that was the first time the diaspora actually played a political role. And it's continued since then. But the diaspora is divided and polarized like the society it came from and like the society it is in. I would say. The US democratic system is also polarized. Um, and so the Indian American diaspora is polarized. Uh, according to most surveys, it's a majority lib liberal, small d Democrat um, diaspora. Uh, most of it votes uh, for the Democratic Party and fundraises with the Democratic Party. But yes, there are about 15 to 20 percent which are conservative or vote um, uh, you know, conservatively or for Republican candidates. Um, sort of, you know, their in the involvement will continue. The impact it will have, you can already see it. Um, you know, sort of a lot of the demands that the Biden administration has on the human rights front or religious freedom or democracy front uh, within India have come from the democratic base and the Indian American democratic base, um, not necessarily from, you know, sort of uh, within the Republican base as much. And so you see that and it will play out. Um, sort of, you know, the more polarized this country gets or India gets, the more likely it will have an impact on the diaspora. But I don't, I mean, I see the diasporas, you know, sort of getting stronger, uh, but with the polarization continue, yes, it will. We live in a polarized world and society, so I don't see that changing. But the, its impact will be both positive in the sense of more investment, uh, more trade and technology, um, you know, a deeper U.S.-India partnership, but it will also reflect the concerns which the diaspora has and American society has. Remember, the Indian-American diaspora is our American citizens. So, they may be, uh, Mr. Ramaswamy may be a Republican candidate, he's an American citizen. His policy is going to look at what is good for the United States, just as Vice President Harris is an American citizen. She was born in this country. And so her, concern, her view towards India, they will, while there is a cultural connect, it is still what the US needs for its national security and economic reasons, not what India needs. If I could add one please, thing. One, please, one thing. It, it doesn't speak to any of the, that excellent analysis, but one bizarre anecdote that you could look at from the economic dynamics. If you look at, going back to your original question about is India following the same kind of economic entanglement that China followed and therefore would the United States regret it like a lot do right now with China? Um, the state-led model that China used to essentially use its market advantages to gain U.S. business interest. Um, yes, the Chinese American community was a part of that, but it wasn't a key factor in driving that trade. The Indian American diaspora and, and community in general is a key factor driving certain economic ties, especially in these sectors that are becoming less state driven and more open to the market and they want to be more regional, if not globally focused. Um, and you're starting to see this, like even the, 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 the moon landing. This, the, the Indian domestic space industry has made advances because they realized that they need to diversify away from a single channel of state funding and state-driven um, and, and state, uh, research. And it's still driven by the state, just like NASA still drives the U.S. system. But there's all these now new upstarts that are coming in, and a lot of them are tied to the Indian community that's located in Europe or in Canada or the United States or in, in Southeast Asia. And I think that is a t type of entanglement that is a net positive that you're seeing will grow. 
and it will expand. There's all sorts of different ways you can, especially in the tech sector, um, which gets a lot of attention, obviously, because certain people are running for, for the presidential bid right now. <laughs> so we're out of time, but uh, I want to follow up very quickly on uh, Nick's uh, question. You, and you mentioned that it's, uh, there's polarization, and you focused on the, the, the American domestic polarization. What if you overlay the Indian polarization onto that? Then what happens? So I'd say, I mean, sort of, it is, I mean, you can see it um, across the city. You can see it in things which happen when the, um, if you look, if we go back to the June summit and the pomp and show and regalia which happened, there were people protesting out of the White House. There were people protesting in New York. Um, you know, one of the questions which was asked was about democracy um, in the press conference. Um, you know, and the Biden administration sort of repeatedly said that questions on democracy, on human rights, on religious freedom were part of the conversation. So that would not have been there if sort of, you know, if the, if the Indian American diaspora had not been polarized. There is a large Indian American diaspora, sort of Indian American presence in the Democratic Party, in the base fundraising. Um, and so all of those people did send their message up, up the value chain, um, that there were concerns. And there were a number of media stories which came out where Indian Americans were talking about their concerns about what's happening. Because we must remember the Indian American diaspora does not reflect the exact percentage of religious affiliations as in India. India is 82% Hindu. The diaspora is not 82% Hindu. The diaspora is sort of, you know, it's majority Hindu, but there's a very large Muslim, Christian, Sikh, you know, Jain, Buddhist, all of these sort of, you know, even Parsi. And so that diaspora, if it is left of center majority, and if, it con if it's part of the political system, and it contributes to, the, to any political party, it will ensure that its questions are raised. And we saw that in the summit. And we will continue to see it if there are any sort of, you know, conversations around the city, on the hill, within the administration, those concerns will come out. Thank you so much. We have run out of time. Uh, this was a fascinating and very rich conversation. I thank you both. Uh, uh, folks, that was our uh, event on India's rise. We'll continue to uh, work on India. We'll continue to, my portfolio will look at the broader Eurasia as well. We're looking at China and, and, and do follow us for, you know, other topics that the New Lines Institute focuses on. We have a wide range of portfolios and projects that we are pursuing. Uh, thank you once again. And until next time, this is Kamran Bukhari signing off. Thank you. <laughs>